Hello. Hey. Welcome to our podcast. I'm not. Nope. <laughs> I'm just gonna keep my mouth shut over here. Oh. Okay. Nope. I can't. Well, you're be Welcome. Ah. <laughs> oh man. I just can't help it. She can't. She has severe issues. No self control. We're really. trying to work on it. It's valid. <laughs> uh, hopefully you listen to Boys on the Tracks oh, number one. Oh, I'm Hannah. Ooh. <laughs> oh, she knows her name. I I'm remembered. so proud of you. I remembered for once and you didn't. Good girl. <laughs> she didn't remember. I fucking remembered. I'm Megan. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm all proud of myself now. I feel accomplished for the night. Well, hopefully <laughs> you listen to Boys on the Tracks, number one. If you didn't, you should probably stop this one and go back to Boys on the Tracks, number one. Because you're going to be miss awkward. a lot. Yeah. That'd be weird. Yeah. You don't want to jump into the second part. Uh, but if you did, I got you. I'm going to give you a quick summary. <laughs> also, Megan kind of disappointed me in the last episode of oh. not fucking up enough. I did once. And that's it. It was just <sighs> once. It was magic. And it's like, tonight I was looking forward to it. Pure magic. But I've I'm... got the magic <laughs> in me. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm still tipsy even without your fuck up, so that's what really matters. Mm. Anyways, go ahead with that summary. <laughs> okay. Previously on drinking the Kool Aid. Oh, <laughs> you would bet. All right, we're fancy. All right, cocaine was a big problem <laughs> in the 1980s in Arkansas. <laughs> cocaine. <laughs> cocaine. Oh, oh boy, <laughs> this is gonna be weird. Uh, 17-year-old Kevin Ives and 16-year-old Don Henry went out hunting one night and they were later found on the tracks lying parallel and were hit by a train. The blood was purplish, which the EMTs and the train crew thought was very strange and they felt that the boys did not die from hitting or from being hit by the train. From hitting the train. Yeah, they hit the train. Ooh. I just got to say I completely actually forgot about the cocaine already because I was so into the rest of the story <laughs> so when you said that it really took me by surprise <laughs> and you just came right on cocaine so i was I like wait what i don't know why i was so enthusiastic about I don't know. shouting cocaine but i was so oh. like i was actually thrown off because i was like wait weren't we talking about people on railroad tracks i am yes. back on board now i had actually gotten so into the story i forgot okay well the deputies, if you remember, are saying that this is a suicide. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, how can I forget? Sure. State medical examiner Fami Malik is a real piece of shit. And he ruled that the boys smoked 20 marijuana <laughs> cigarettes and just simply fell asleep on the tracks. 20 marijuanas. All those marijuanas <laughs> they be smoking. The family is obviously frustrated. They held a pro uh, there you go. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Okay. I can't believe... Oh, yes! Thank you. Hmm. Okay. Well, they held a press conference, <laughs> and they wanted to get the case reopened. Luckily, this plan was successful, and you're all caught up. Hey. All right. Now that the case is reopened... Prosecutor Richard Garrett had Kevin and Don's bodies exhumed for another autopsy. A new pathologist concluded that they smoked between one and three Stop. marijuana cigarettes. Stop. Not We're 20, like Fami Malik said. We're still on this topic. Listen, there was all this so keeps much marijuana. <laughs> He also found evidence that indicated that one of the boys was already dead and the other was unconscious when they were hit by the train. In 1988, the ruling of accidental death was changed to undetermined following the discovery of new information after the second autopsy. I just got to say, it's real, real interesting mm -hmm. how autopsies tend to be completely fucking different mm -hmm. 
from different person. Yeah. One person says, oh, you know, just smoked a little marijuana, passed out, like, no big deal. And then the other one's coming in like, come, like, mm-mm, this ain't what happened. And it's just crazy how suddenly these mm-hmm. people are having opposite things, but they both do the same exact job that should get you to the exact same conclusion. It should indeed. Hmm. And now... A grand jury ruled their deaths as probable homicide. Hmm. Yeah. Was it? Fami Malik. <laughs> Take note. Oh, I hate him. Richard Garrett started investigating the green tarp that allegedly covered the boys on the tracks. Multiple witnesses on the train confirmed seeing it covering them. The police who were initially on the scene later claimed that Stephen never told them about seeing the tarp. Now, um, I actually had forgotten about the tarp, and now now I'm a little bit confused because I'm like, how would you see they're not moving if there's a tarp on them? So the tarp only covered half of their bodies. Okay. So it did not cover, like, their heads. Like the top half? Yes. Okay, okay. Correct. So that's how they were able to see they were not moving. That's a good question. I'm back. All right. Uh, So Stephen Schroyer insisted that he absolutely did tell them about the tarp, even though the initial investigators claimed it did not exist. Richard believes it was there and just never found. How would it be possible for a tarp to be never... I'm just saying, like, I feel like there would be parts... This is going to sound morbid, but, like, I feel like there would be parts shredded into their bodies, like their body parts, you know what I'm saying? Sure, yeah. Because... If it's there. Unless it flew off I, prior, which I guess is possible. Suppose, but you're going to see it, like, yes. somewhere in the vicinity. Mm-hmm. But otherwise, I feel like it would just be, like, intertwined with body parts. I, that would be, like, impossible to miss, I feel like. I don't know. Yeah. And Richard says, all of the people on the train who were able to observe the scene prior to the accident stated that the boys were partially covered by a green tarp. When the police started questioning the tarp's existence, Richard said, quote, that to me would be like questioning the existence of the boys on the tracks, because what's real is real and what's not is not. And it was there as well as the boys. Weird. Train conductor Jerry Tomlin was enraged about the fact that deputy talent denied the existence of the tarp. The conductor says, He said I didn't tell him about finding the tarp, but I did, and I told him where part of it was, at the bridge bulkhead. I remember it as well as I remember him. I'm pretty observant. I catch most stuff. I remember seeing the tarp as well as I remember how talent was dressed that morning. He had on a navy blue or black ball cap that said Saline County Deputy. He was wearing cowboy boots and blue jeans. He had on a belt buckle that also said Saline County Sheriff's Office. He had a package of cigarettes rolled up in his shirt sleeve like a sailor going on leave. And he had a pistol, an automatic, stuck in the back of his pants like Magnum P.I. I normally have a suspect at this point, but I have got fucking nothing. (laughs) Yeah. Everything about the story is throwing me off. I can't imagine what the poor parents are going through when everywhere they turn, they're getting different stories. This is just, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. This keeps throwing me off so bad. Yeah. The authorities insist that the tarp was just an optical illusion. And never really existed. How could the men, all sitting in different spots of the train, experience the same illusion? Now, I won't dive too far into this part, uh, but I think it's worth noting that six weeks after this case was reopened, Richard found a similar case in Hodgin, Oklahoma, where two young men, Billy Hainline and Dennis Decker, were found lying on the railroad tracks and hit. In 1984, the pair was positioned almost identically to Kevin and Don, and the police have not found any suspects in their deaths. Must have smoked too much or too many marijuanas. It's just a thing going around. (sighs) Must have done too many marijuanas. (sighs) 
Unsolved Mysteries featured a segment on the case in 1988, and Richard was asked to provide his thoughts on the case. He said he thinks the boys saw something that they shouldn't have seen, and it had to do with drugs. There you go. It was like a light bulb literally just went off. That's where it came back around. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I keep forgetting about that part because I'm just so into this story. (laughs) Sheriff Steed refused to allow any funds to be used in the investigation of this theory. He also lied about where he sent the boys' clothes for examination. He said he sent the clothes to the FBI, but he actually sent them to the Arkansas State Crime Lab. Steed was not reelected as county sheriff following the involvement of this case. Right. We got one thing here, folks. (laughs) (laughs) Richard Garrett ended up having another autopsy conducted on Kevin and Don. There was evidence of stab wounds on Don's shirt, and Kevin had been struck in the head with the butt of a rifle. This now changed the investigation to homicide. Oh, yeah? It's no longer probable homicide. A former wrestler, Billy Jack Haynes, who was well known in the 80s, said that he witnessed the murders of Kevin and Don. What? (sighs) Yeah. He said in a video, I come with no mask. I come with no hidden voice. I come to you straight, face to face, because this is reality, man. He claimed he was compelled to come forward after the shooting death of Seth Richard, who was an employee of the Democratic National Committee. He explained that he used to be a drug trafficker and a hired enforcer during the 80s and was introduced to a politician drug dealer in Arkansas. He alleged that the unnamed politician asked him to kill David Kennedy, the son of Robert F. Kennedy in 1984. What? The Kennedys made it into another one. The fuck? (laughs) I am so sorry. Why did it was literally... The Kennedys somehow always weasel their way into, like, stories. The fucking Kennedys and the Clintons. Yeah, I was just gonna say the Clintons. (laughs) Yeah. <sighs> okay. I was way too pumped about that. I did not have sexual relations <sighs> with that woman. <laughs> okay, for real. When I was in high school, anytime we went down the line, on that's my what wire. it would be. <laughs> <laughs> on fucking line wire, dude. You'd have like yeah. 12 songs that were good, and then there would just be three in a row. I did not have sexual <laughs> relations with that woman. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's awesome. It wasn't just me. No. (laughs) We all had it. Oh man. (laughs) Okay. Billy Jack says In August of 1987, I was contacted by the Arkansas criminal politician and was asked to provide muscle at an Arkansas drug stop. The criminal politician suspected that some drug money drops were being stolen. While he was conducting security during the alleged drug purchase, he claims he witnessed the murders of Kevin and Don. He also claimed that the politician believed police officers were involved in the theft of the drug money. Huh! Now are you picking it up? (laughs) This is getting real interesting. This is a twisted one, man. He said the boys were murdered by people working for the same criminal politician. Witnesses say that they saw police officers beating Kevin and Don before tossing them in the back of a truck and speeding off the night of their deaths. And police officers would know how to get rid of their body. Mm -hmm. Just saying. Yeah. And then real interesting that all of a sudden the deputies don't see any problem and as soon as they arrive. Motherfucking medical examiner. Fami Malik. <sighs> <sighs> okay. Ready? I don't know. Here we go. All right. Before Bill Clinton was president, he was the governor of Arkansas. For several years, he refused to dismiss state medical examiner Fami Malik. What? Yes. The shit. Uh-huh. 
there was, of course, a lot of controversy over this topic, including the fact that the medical examiner provided a ruling that helped Clinton's mother, a nurse anesthesiist, avoid scrutiny in the death of a patient while she was defending herself in a medical malpractice lawsuit. My God, the more you know. Mm Mm-hmm. You like that? After this incident, the medical examiner was protected by the governor and the state crime laboratory board. The laboratory board would have authority over the state medical examiner, but Clinton appointed the board members. Bill Clinton and his board refused to fine Fahmy Malik, even though records showed that he testified incorrectly in criminal cases. His rulings were reversed by juries and outside pathologists, and they challenged his findings. In one case, he misread a medical chart and wrongly accused a deputy county coroner of killing someone. Oh, hell no. (sighs) How do you misread that? Yeah, we're going to get to that later, girl. In another case... He based court testimony on tissue samples that DNA tests later indicated had been mixed up with other tissue samples. Three weeks before Bill Clinton announced his presidential candidacy, he pushed Fahmy Malik to resign. The Clinton administration found him another well-paying job in state government. The fuck? Yeah, there's something weird. I am. I was so pissed. With the Clintons, I can't handle it. Oh, and good. Let's take him from a medical examiner and put him in the freaking government. Why not? A writer, Max Brantley, wrote a column where he said, We may never know why Malik enjoyed such strong support. Critics will note accurately that Malik has made an autopsy finding helpful to Clinton's mother. Clinton wrote a statement to the Times saying, There has never been any connection between my mother's professional experiences and actions I have taken or not taken as governor of Arkansas, and I resent any implications otherwise. In fact, it was several years after the incident that I became aware through the media that the ruling made by Dr. Malik in this case was controversial. I do not have the professional knowledge necessary to judge the competency of a forensic pathologist. For several years prior to Dr. Malik's resignation as medical examiner, I requested that reviews of his performance be conducted and that appropriate action be taken by the Crime Lab Board and or the Medical Examiner Commission. It was their decision to retain him. Over the years... Fahmy Malik's rulings were questioned many times. I wonder why. (laughs) In fact, there was controversy in more than 20 additional deaths. I'm sorry, 20? 20. Oh, good God. So I, of course, think that we should go over a couple of these so you can see how fucking awful this guy is. Oh, I'd love to. All right. Albright case. On June 28th, 1985. I thought you were going to say June 20th. I was like, don't you do that to me a no, few girl. days before. Raymond. That's, wait, I should probably clarify that's my birthday. Otherwise, that oh my made, gosh. It made no sense otherwise because I'm just like, how dare you? <laughs> yeah, not on June 20th, a mm-hmm. random day of the year. And I thought you were going to tell me some like murder or some shit happened on June 20th. And I was like, can you not like a few days before? <laughs> Maybe I can find a good one for you. Fucking rude. No, I don't. (laughs) Okay. Wait, maybe. We'll see. Okay. (laughs) Raymond P. Albright was found in his yard dead from gunshot wounds. He was arrested the night before on charges of theft. Malik ruled his death as a suicide, but he had been shot five times in the chest. Oh, I'm sorry. Is that not how you, you is that not how suicide works? You, you can just go ahead and shoot yourself five fucking times. five times in the chest? Yes. Uh, Good the God. weapon was a high powered semi automatic pistol. Jeez. Mm-hmm. What is with him and the suicides? Right. It's this just... dude must have this dude must have done too many marijuanas too. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I just can't let it go. It's no, too entertaining. Can't. Keeps coming back. Uh, Malcolm case. 
on June 14th, 1989. What's with your June dates? <laughs> Andrew Smith was declared brain dead at University Hospital in Little Rock, and police said he shot himself. Life support was oh, withdrawn. I'm sorry, another suicide? Yes. And a week later, Malik told officers that the order to end life support was given by a deputy coroner, Mark Malcolm, who had not consulted the family. Police investigated this and discovered that the attending physician used a symbol on the medical chart that means life support will end after the family has been consulted. The director of the state health department said Malik just simply made a mistake and he <laughs> thought that the symbol meant without family consultation. It's a real interesting mistake. But don't you worry, he apologized. Oh, good. I'm glad. That makes it so much better. Does it? Do you get all the warm fuzzies? Mm, yeah. Okay, good. Feeling it right now. <laughs> um, let's do one more. Stephen Case. On August 18th, 1990, Gregory Stevens was fatally shot on the front porch of his home. Witnesses said that he had been shot from 40 feet away. Malik took the stand and said he was shot at point-blank range. They had an evaluation from three outside pathologists, and they all agreed that Gregory had not been shot at point-blank range, and one of them stated that it seemed like Malik studied the wrong tissue samples. <laughs> A I'm DNA sure that's what happened. analysis confirmed that either blood samples or tissue samples that Malik used came from another corpse. What the fuck? Uh-huh. I oh told my you, god. He is a piece of shit. Oh my god. I can't stand this guy. Listen, I am so heated right now that we are fogging up the window. It's true. So now she can't look at my chickpeas. <laughs> Hey, I can still see them slightly. Yeah, that now was foggy. That was my first thought, though. I was like, oh, no, I can't see them anymore. That's weird. Now I can't make fun of your peas and beans. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> At least I'm not rolling down the stairs. I hope I'm not either. Um, okay, so the information was, of course, presented to Bill Clinton, and he ignored the claims. <laughs> After the grand jury overruled Malik in the case for Kevin and Don, Clinton hired two out-of-state out pathologists to review Malik's performance. They gave him high marks and said he should get a raise. Oh, I'm sure he should. <laughs> it really sounds like he should. He's doing a great job. Uh, the visiting pathologists were paid $20,000 from Clinton's discretionary fund. What the shit? They both agreed during meetings with the state officials not to conduct syst uh, systematic reviews oh. <laughs> oh, there was. of Malik's cases. Two months later, Clinton sent a proposal to the legislator to raise Malik's salary by 41.5%. Stop. Stop it. 41.5%. You... you are shitting me. So that his salary would be $117,875. <gasps> oh my God. Like what the actual fuck? Oh my God. Yeah. I have been freaking out over this case, like freaking out. I am very intrigued to hear how much Clinton is involved in this. Mm -hmm. It went from like me thinking it was going to be a teeny weeny little piece that he was yeah. involved in to mm -hmm. like, holy shit, he's really part of this. He's part of this. Yeah, I'm telling you he is. Uh, during the hearings regarding the proposed pay raise, there were a few people who felt that they were wronged by Malik's decisions in the past, and they began exchanging phone numbers. They formed an organization yes. called... Yes. Vomit. Yes! Ready? Victims of Malik's incredible testimony. I love it. Vomit. I fucking love it. Mm -hmm. They started a petition and collected signatures for three years. Vomit says... 
Clinton's staff <laughs> refused to let them present the petition to the governor. Okay, now I want to go over the incident that Clinton's mother was involved with that I talked about earlier. Okay. Okay. On June 27th, 1981. Back to June. Yes. Billy Ray Washington, a black man. Did you were going to say Cyrus. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, he was walking home with his wife after a late night at a bar. A car full of young whites rolled past and someone in the car shouted racial slurs at the couple. No, don't fucking do that. It's disgusting. Stop Ever. it. They threw a beer can at Billy Ray. <sighs> in response, he threw a chunk of concrete. The car windows were open and the concrete slammed into the face of Susan Deer, a 17-year-old single mother who was in the back seat of the car and she was sitting next to like a stack of beer cans. Uh, yep. Uh, what? Yep. I'm sorry, everything a little about drinking the, and driving. About the, everything about that whole entire sentence mm -hmm. was just completely messed up. Yes. Uh, her friends brought her to the hospital. And even though she was bleeding profusely, the doctors didn't feel that she needed immediate surgery. Susan uh, underwent surgery that was described as non-critical. It was what? to... Now, here's the thing that's confusing. So this was to repair her teeth, her nose, and her face. Um, that, to me, would be pretty critical. Um, and if you're bleeding profusely... That seems critical. Mm, that seems like a little bit of an issue. It does. Uh, but they said it's not. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, we'll just wait till morning. No big deal. <laughs> so during the early portion of the surgery, the records show that she was very stable. Her vital signs were excellent. Uh, stable blood pressure and no abnormalities to cardiac rhythm. Here we go. Susan's parents arrived and were told repeatedly by the nurses that were entering and leaving her room that Susan was doing fine and would be out of surgery in just a little while. Suddenly, the nurses stopped coming out of the room, and her parents were told that Susan was dead. Clinton's mother, Jeez. Virginia Dwyer Kelly, was the nurse anesthetist. The records show the doctor asked her to transfer oxygen tubes from Susan's nose to her throat so they could proceed with her nose surgery. There was difficulty during the transfer and she was not able to insert the tubes into her throat. An ear, nose, throat specialist had to take over for her. The records do not show how long Susan was without oxygen, but immediately after the oxygen transfer, her heartbeat slowed, and within seconds, she went into complete cardiac arrest. The team tried to revive her for an hour, but she was pronounced dead. Malik performed the autopsy, and didn't question any of the medical care that she received. He ruled that her death was caused by blunt trauma, and he said it was homicide. Oh, I'm sorry. Not a suicide this time? No. Nope. She didn't come out of her surgery and shoot herself? No, she didn't. Holy what crap. What a surprise. Based on Malik's ruling, Billy Ray was charged with negligent homicide. Both the doctor and ENT submitted reports and said Malik should have considered the possibility that Susan died due to inadequate care during the surgery. Soon after the incident, Virginia's uh, hospital privilege as a nurse anesthetist was revoked and she filed a lawsuit against the hospital. A year later, she ended up dropping the action, and she and the hospital both agreed to pay their own legal costs. The hospital said her privileges had been revoked due to the possibility of malpractice. At the time of Susan's case, Virginia was also being sued in another case involving the death of a young mother, also from a lack of oxygen following minor elective surgery. <sighs> I just don't love this. No? <laughs> I mean, it's a really interesting story. It's just so messed up. There's... Every turn in every direction you go. Too much shit that points to 
Clinton covering things up and then the police covering things up and all for like and jobs. fucking what's his nuts? Fami Malik. Yep. I was going to say Malik. I couldn't come up with the first name, but there it is. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So essentially going back to some of the things that we were talking about earlier, you know, according to the train engineer, Stephen Schroyer, he noticed that the boys were covered by that green tarp. And he also said that Don's 22 rifle was laying next to the railroad track. But the investigators claimed that they could not find that green tarp. And remember earlier in the story, I mentioned that there was another case similar to this one. Well, Billy Don Halen, who was 26, and Dennis Decker, who was 21, were both found motionless in Kansas City, Oklahoma, on the railroad tracks. And... Um, they were in very similar positions to Kevin and Don in the way that they were found. They were run over by a train and killed, and autopsy showed that they had alcohol in their systems, oh. and they were near the legal limit. The county coroner ruled the deaths accidental and believed they fell asleep on the track. Huh. Funny how that works. Right. Wow, you just do fucking anything, and you're just going to fall asleep on the track, You I just guess. fall asleep. It's a thing that happens. It's just you wander out onto specifically railroad tracks and just decide to take a nap. Now, the reason that I bring this one back up is because when the case was reopened a year later in 1985, investigators focused on the possibility that drugs were involved. Mm. A meth lab was discovered oh. one and a half miles from the tracks. Ooh, oops. Yeah. And we also talked about the mysterious man that was seen in the military fatigues near right, the tracks. Right, the guy that blends in and hides. <laughs> yeah. So I think that that's something to also keep in mind. So after going through this, I'm like, okay, was this a police cover-up, a government cover-up? Did the boys stumble across a drug job? I'm still, I still have nothing. Right. Because the nearby airport was known as a hub for cocaine operations. Right. And witnesses were coming forward stating that the drug traffickers had an arrangement with city officials and even the CIA was Saline County prosecuting attorney Dan Harmon, who was actually the first one assigned to helping the families. And he was later charged with federal drug and racketeering charges. So some people say that Dan Harmon was at the tracks when the boys were murdered as well. Yeah. So the last thing that I'll leave you with on this one is some of the other, I guess, mysteries that are intertwined in the story. Okay. Um, Okay. So Dan Harmon hired someone named Keith McCaskill to take aerial photographs of the crime scene uh, during the investigation. Shortly shortly after. (laughs) Ah, yes. Ah, I was doing so good, kind of. No, you were you were getting there. <laughs> uh, shortly after the investigation, he was murdered. In 1989, Greg Collins was called to the grand jury concerning the case and was found dead with his face blown off by a shotgun. Oof, duh. All right. Yeah. That escalated quick. Uh-huh. A witness, Keith Coney, died in a motorcycle crash. A witness, Jeffrey Edward Rhodes, his body was found in a landfill. And then also there was a witness, Daniel Booney Bearden, who mysteriously disappeared. God, that was such a cool name, too. <sighs> what know. was it? Uh, Daniel Booney Bearden. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So uh, there you have it. We Whoa. have lots of... Weird things happening in this story, and it's still unsolved. That's a- Are you flipping <laughs> kidding me? You just took me down a two-part rabbit hole of a story, uh-huh. and you're just going to leave me on its on fucking solved Yes. Uh, probably because of Clinton. So nice job. Clinton I hate you right now. Fami Malik. I hate you right now. I'm done with you. I want out of here. I'm done now. Uh, okay. <laughs> Do you uh, have any theories? What do you think? I really am just pissed at you now. Okay. 
<laughs> because I thought that you were going to end it. Well, I guess I shouldn't have expected you to end it with anything good because it does have the Clintons involved. Oh, my God. But, right. like, I really did not expect it to be a unsolved mystery. So I'm really salty right now. <laughs> like, after everything that I've gone over... And knowing that this was for real, like, a place for, you know, drug drops, and so many witnesses are referring to that and right. saying that's what's going on, I think that it makes, you know, perfect sense that the boys accidentally walked up on it. Can you imagine how much money the medical examiner is freaking making from this shit? Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. Yeah. He is probably sitting so flipping pretty. <laughs> like, yeah. seriously. I mean, I don't know if he's alive anymore. I know. Well, I, but... <laughs> right. But you, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. the amount of money that he probably made off of this. Mm-hmm. Oh. I know. I I just, I don't get how people even, I don't really give a shit how much money you're making. How could you morally bring yourself it's disgusting. I just don't get it. I yeah. don't get it. And to not give the family the closure That's that why. they deserve, like, this is so horrendous. I just morally don't get it. Yeah. I obviously would love to see this case solved. It's just bananas. But I, I think that it's one of them that is solvable, but probably won't be, right. only because there's, like, so many Look politicians and... Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yep. Um, too many people of power involved in this. Right. So, there Oof. you go. All right, that was uh, that was an interesting one. Yeah. Man. <laughs> uh huh. So, thanks for drinking the Kool Aid with us. Like us on Facebook, and please tell all of your friends uh, and subscribe to our podcast on any of your podcast apps that you're using. Um, bye. bye.